Hello everyone, my name is Sheep in the Car. Today we're building a stock aircraft in KSB. The intent of this plane is to be a seaplane. Now, seaplanes have had a long and interesting history in the real world because pretty much anywhere when there isn't a runway, you've got to have somewhere to land, and the most available large flat area has always been the sea. Now, this might seem a little odd in KSP because people land regular planes all the time and hey, most stuff happens in orbit anyway. But given there are only two runways in the entire known universe of KSP and both of them were in sight of each other, the idea actually makes perfectly valid sense. Now, there's some technical challenges involved in this process and the number one reason is that the sea is actually more destructive than land. This is because li literally anything that touches it, you take its speed, and that's the amount of impact damage it takes. If that's bigger than its impact tolerance, it's instantly destroyed. So pretty much submerse a ship, even pretty slowly, and anything that's not super robust is smashed to pieces. Now, I've chosen a pretty standard design for this, or rather happened upon, I sort of made it up as I went along, for a float plane, which is, you know, the two skis, overhead wing, and propeller on front. I've gone to two side jets, because propellers aren't great in KSB. I've made a video of one recently, and I'm intending to do a longer mission. You can check that out at the end of this video, but all things considered, it's pretty difficult and pretty short range. Jets are far more reliable. Second of all, I've chosen to go for this funny double wing and three skis layout. The skis you'll see later. Now the reason for this is because pretty much the design is set up to place the centre of thrust below the centre of mass, the centre of drag above the centre of mass, and pretty much all the factors trying to roll us, you know, pitch upwards, nose into the air. This is because when we touch our skis down, they'll have a massive amount of drag, and that will shift our centre of drag below the centre of mass and try and roll us forward. So we want everything possible preloading the vessel. So you're having to pull constantly nose up the entire t sorry nose down the entire time you're trying to fly it. So when you hit the sea, it tries to pull your nose down, and so you're trying to pull the nose up less. But because everything's going to be then pushing us in the same direction, we need some pretty intense pitch authority. I achieved this via a large tail with canards on it, which are lift factor of 0 0.7 which is one of the more powerful um, of your controls, aerodynamic control surfaces and I end up using quite a few SAS units as well. Now the odd thing about these jet powered seaplanes is jets sort of occurred an era after float planes were already dying. There were a few military applications especially for your strategic bombers but there wasn't really a whole lot. In fact, as far as I know, there's only really one plane that would ever be considered as equivalent to what I'm building here. And that was the Covier Sea Dart. There was a prototype aircraft, they only ever manufactured 12 of them, for the US Navy. Now, pretty much its idea was it could sit in the water near a carrier or anything similar, and without a requirement for an aircraft carrier, it could take off intercept enemy aircraft or enemy boats and fire unguided missiles at them. It was a supersonic aircraft powered by two 27 kilonewton jet engines. Due to our much worse aerodynamics we have about just over 200 kilonewtons of thrust and we're barely supersonic ourselves. But it's pretty equivalent aircraft. It weighs about 44% less fully loaded than we do but two jets it was a flying boat style design but again seaplane um, it wasn't amphibious like we are now by amphibious I mean we can land on both land and water this is an essential part of building a float plane at KSP because you start on the runway like it or not and on a runway floats don't do you a hell of a lot of good now we're coming for our landing here, and this is the first real unique bit about flying a seaplane. Our goal is pretty much to get a few meters above the water. I aim for about four or five, and then pretty much stall onto it. 
because you want to be going forward as slowly as possible. Remember, the game here isn't differentiating us falling and thus moving forward, so we just want to get our total speed as low as possible. And I got it to about 26, 27 meters a second. Now, this plane pitches backward a little bit when it's just sitting in the water, because as I said, everything's been set up to try and help it pitch upward. Which makes it a bit hectic to try and hold it still, but we can land and we can take off again. And at this stage I was pretty happy with myself, I thought, congratulations, you've finished this video, we've finished everything. However, I so began to throttle up here and watch the killer newtons begin to go skywards and our speed begin to pick up. I sat there and I think, went, with this much air intake, we could go pretty high and pretty fast and actually make a usable aircraft out of this thing. Yet these jets, they're not going to do it. As we begin to go higher, we're at the point where the thrusts beginning to curtail pretty soon. So I thought, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's build it all again. And here we are, fit, retrofitting it with bigger jets. Pretty much bigger jets, and we're going to add a bit more intakes, and just muck with the staging to make the ejection system actually work, because it's a good thing we didn't need it last time. I've also added another pair of landing gear to the top. These extra landing gear help counterbalance the heavier jets at the bat. Now, we weigh a little bit more in this form. 11.3 um, tons with 96 or 97 parts, I think. I don't entirely remember. But 11.3 tons is pretty heavy. As I said, that's 44% difference to the Covier Sea Dart and about 25% heavier than your average twin engine seaplane which is really its class now since this is post commentary it goes without a surprise that the shown video is a successful one with this revised version I actually managed to get the first try so there isn't another take on the other hand the first one I actually had to do a second take because I foolishly decided to try and land with the skids level as you can see, you land with his nose as much up as possible here. Because if we touch the re rear skis first, we roll onto the front one, rather than touching the front one first and rolling onto our nose. Okay, so nothing's broken on this, and we're on to the final part of this mission. Actually seeing how far and fast we can take this. In the real world, it wouldn't be a serious consideration you would be far better to use a small light propeller aircraft and get there slower but get there in one piece and get there on less fuel. In KSP however we don't want to sit and watch a screen for the next couple of hours. On the other hand sitting there and burning a thousand tons of fuel in a second that doesn't worry us too much because we're not paying for it. So without further ado I decide let's see how hard we can push this puppy into the sky and I was actually pleasantly surprised with the results. Okay, this aircraft as you can see is producing about the same power at this speed and altitude as the other one was, but it was beginning to fall by now, whereas we're beginning to climb, so the difference is going to become apparent quite soon. Now, the speeds you can get to in KSP have never been quite realistic per se, because the sphere of influence of the planet is much smaller, it's a much denser mass. What this ends up meaning is that when we get to an altitude, even though pressure at sea level is the same and gravity at sea level is the same, for a given altitude our gravity and our pressure is much much lower. Also the way air intakes work is a little bit strange. Spamming air intakes is a great way of getting to orbit with almost no fuel and to be honest, by now I just consider it so cheaty, any design will spam the air intake, so I just yawn and ignore it. Now, this design, it's a bit of a borderline case, to be honest. It's got two radial intakes, two ram air intakes, and those two engine nozzle aids, so it's really got as much intake per engine as you can justify and still have a, any reasonable attempt on reality. On the other hand, it has a ridiculous amount of thrust for its mass, and our high amount of lift allows us to maintain a fairly low angle of attack. Altogether, this means we've got low drag, 
As you can see we're beginning to get re-entry effects. I was busy taking screenshots, which you can probably tell by the interface flashing on and off, thinking that this is as fast as this thing would go. Boy was I wrong. Now, the final speed of the copy air, which I told you about, the final aircraft in that crop class, was about Mark 1.3 or so. It was supersonic, but that was about all that could be said for it. The final speed of this aircraft is about 1,430 meters a second. 1,430 meters a second is 5,148 kilometers an hour. And that's awfully fast, especially when you consider that at this sort of altitude, sea level, uh, sorry, unlike sea level, the speed of sound is only about 300 meters a second. So 1,440, that's a very good attempt at five times. Of course, reality is less than that, but it's significant. And the fire sure does look interesting with all those skis and struts hanging down. Which is something I've really found in KSB. The better it looks for going fast, the worse it looks whilst going fast. If you take a brick and you throw it through the sky at you know, re-entry type speeds, we get a dramatic effect. Our aircraft actually designed for these speeds don't. And as a result, this aircraft is quite good looking. Having said that, I don't ever volunteer to be in a real float plane at 29 kilometers of heights, let alone a smaller world. Anyway, till next time, I've been Sheep in the Count, I hope you've enjoyed the video.